follows her. And then she walks away, and then directly in front of me, within three feet, right, is Chef David Breeden, who is the chef de cuisine of the French Laundry. Yes. And whose name was on the resume, right? So I, I wrote it to Chef David Breeden. Yeah. And so I'm holding that in my hand. I'm holding the bottle of wine. I look at Chef David, and I said, Chef, if you have a moment of time, I would like to chat with you. And he looks at me, he looks me up and down, and he says, absolutely, follow me this way. And in my head, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm like, holy shit. And we go outside, sit down at this table. I put the resume down to make sure he sees his name, and then I put the bottle of wine down to make sure he saw where it said relentless. And he sees that. I'm in a suit, right? And he's like, you can just tell in his head, he's like, who is this kid? Yeah. You know? And I was like, chef, I know you're very busy. I'm out here staging for two weeks. I'm an apprentice. I just graduated from, you know, Sea Island Resorts. Yeah. And I just want to see if there'd be an opportunity to work, to stage at the French Laundry for a day. Yeah. And it has made such an impact on my career thus far. And I would love to spend some time here. I'm just looking for an opportunity to work hard. Yeah. And we literally chatted for like 45 minutes. And he asked me about Georgia. He asked me about, you know, when towards the end of my time at Georgia, I w was running the breakfast restaurant there. Yeah. And so he was really impressed with my – he just – he – he told me this later, but he was like, oh, this guy, if this guy can cook eggs for 300 people, I can get him to cook fish or whatever, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, answered every question. And what I didn't know at the time was that the, there's kind of three chefs I worked with. There's three or four chefs I worked with at Sea Island. One was Chef David, David Carrier, uh -huh. who was Grant Ackett's uh, sous chef at one point. Yeah. Another was a guy named Daniel Zeal who worked under a chef named Scott Crawford. Okay. Now, Scott Crawford was actually Chef David Breeden's chef at the Woodlands back in Tennessee. Whoa. And I didn't know that at the time, but Chef David put that together. And so, uh, he put that together, and I think that's what sparked just enough curiosity yeah. to continue talking to me. Uh-huh. And not just, you know... I mean, he was a very busy chef, you know? Fuck yeah. And so... This is lunch service, right? This is lunch this service. Time, yeah. And honestly, I learned later that it wasn't... It was his day off. He wasn't even supposed to be there that day. And so it just worked out perfectly, yeah. you know? And so we had this conversation. We could end the conversation. And he was like, do you have black socks? Yes, chef. Black pants? Yes, chef. White t-shirt? Yes, chef. Sharp knives? Yes, chef. I was like, okay, be here Sunday at noon, the gold door in the back. Yeah. And I was like, yes, yeah, chef. And so I show up Sunday at noon, gold door in the back. At the time, honestly, I thought he was messing with me. I was like, what restaurant has a gold door? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and why would they put the gold door in the back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so truly, I was like, all right, well, this sucks. Yeah. I'm getting punked, yeah. you know? And I show up. There's a gold door in the back, and I start walking towards it, and there's this other guy, tall, skinny-looking guy, glasses, basically shaved head. Yeah. And he's, like, running towards the door with a Lexan full of mise en place, right? Yeah. And you could tell it was it was very organized, you know? Yeah. But you could tell that at no point had he thought about opening the door. Yeah. Right? And so I reach forward and I open the door. And then he, like, notices me. And he's like, oh, thanks. And then I was like, hi, I'm Jason. I'm here for Tissage. And that actually, the first person that I ever saw at the French Laundry after I talked to Chef David was Tyler. Whoa. Tyler Vorce. Yeah. He's from episode one. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Is that what a, it couldn't be a better person to be the first person you met at the French Laundry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, you meet him, and then... He went and, you know, got Chef, and then I saw her that day, and then at the end of the day, Chef David told me to give him a call when I got back to Georgia. Yeah. Gave him a call when I got back to Georgia, and he offered me a position. Very cool. And then uh, at this point, is there any lag in you going back, or did you just get on a plane and go right back? He scheduled it three months out. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you had time to get your shit together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so he scheduled it three months out, and um, this was before any of the renovations or anything. So they had a – there was, like, no turnover at the restaurant, you know. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tyler had been there four years. Every, every single person that I talked to had been there minimum of four years. Wow. Yeah, and so, um, you know, I was very fortunate to get a position there. Yeah. And, you know, I called my mom. I told my mom. You know, she started crying, and then of course, man. At this point, she's sending you clippings of Thomas Keller, and you know that must have been a proud day for her. And so I had three months. I went back to work. I got another another job. Yeah. And for three months, I was I was terrified at the oppor- at like the potential of like um I don't know like like I missed my flight or something. Yeah. And then you I don't break have enough. Your leg, and then you're like. I can't, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I was mean, so scared of not having enough money in the bank to cover anything. So for three months, I I got two jobs and I worked. It came out to around a hundred hours a week, mm-hmm. and I did that for three months straight, and then got to the end of it. And honestly, I ended up in the hospital because my body started shutting down. Yeah, you work so much sometimes, your body's just like, nah, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah, and so one night I went to the ER, my throat started closing up, I got yeah. rashes, and apparently if you work that much, it's the same thing as having like a, like a, like an autoimmune disease attack. Whoa. Where your body can't fight off little like uh, viruses and things like that. Yeah. And so, uh, took a couple of days off and then flew to California. Start your, start your life. Now, did you get put up somewhere? Did you have an apartment? So I flew to California. Yeah. Um, I, after I staged, I started looking on Craigslist, found an apartment, and made a deal with this guy. To It was 700 bucks a month. I was like, yo, I'm going to be out here this day, right? Yeah. And again, I didn't have anything lined up. I was like, I'm going to be out here this day. And... Um, he agreed to hold the posit- hold the spot for me, and so got out there, got this apartment. I'm unpacking my bags. I put the suitcases in the closet. I look at the shelf, yeah, and written underneath this shelf shelf was a a note, and it said something like a like a Yamfell's been great. Now off to Chicago, D.C., and I was like note from the chef I worked for in Georgia from when he lived in that apartment when he worked at the French Laundry. What the fuck? Yeah. That is crazy. But once again, we talk about that shit on this show all the time. Legacy. Yeah. Just, you know, people knowing people through hard work and diligence. That's that's cool, man. Hell yeah. So then you knew that was a sign right there. You're like, I'm right. I'm right where I need to be. It was crazy. You know? So... You're working at the laundry, and um, you start off as Comey? Start off as a Comey, yeah. Okay, got you. And then how long did it take you to kind of get up, get out of there, get on the line? So, you know, the Comey position was, in terms of, like, difficulty, was easier than, you know, the stuff we were doing at Sea Island. Because uh-huh. it was just simpler, you know? Uh-huh. At Sea Island, I would work, like, three services a day. We just worked all the time. Yeah. And so... I was Comey for about a month, and then I moved up to PM Comey. I was I did that for a month, and then PM Comey like Comey at the laundry is you do all like the little projects, and then PM Comey you do kind of like pastas and eggshells and things like that. Uh-huh. And then the only job I didn't want to do there was to become the fish butcher. Okay, why and is that? There was another gentleman doing it at the time, and it was a position where you were. You work directly with the chef de cuisine at the restaurant, uh-huh. and then you the manage five to six thousand dollars worth of product a day. Yeah, you know. And I was like, the 
fastest way I'll probably get fired, you know what I mean, is the fact that I don't know how to cut fish. Yeah. And if I start cutting fish in a restaurant with, you know, like, if the fish costs $400 and you make one cut wrong, that might be a $20 cut, you yeah. know? And I'm like, well, that's one position I don't want to do. And then you, it's not like you work with a sous chef and who's a little, maybe a little more lenient. You're working directly with the chef de cuisine in the restaurant. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'll do anything. I don't want to be the fish butcher. And after they been there for two months, Chef David asked me if I would be the fish butcher. <laughs> and what you say? Of course, yes, chef. I said, yes, chef. <laughs> he said, good it. answer. And yeah. I said, thank you, chef. And then, honestly, he unbelievably took me under his wing. Every Saturday, we would cut fish together. Yeah. And he was a master butcher. And so, I cut fish together with him every Saturday for like a year. And truly, cutting fish at that restaurant allowed me to honestly learn my, like, philosophy of, like, how I do things in life. Yeah. And so when I was cutting fish, it was, I mean, it was unbelievably difficult to start. Yeah. You know, I was so slow at the oysters. I would come in at 3 a.m. and start, I would stand on a milk crate and start shucking the oysters. And I'd, I had to stand on a milk crate because they were cleaning the kitchen, uh, the overnight cleaners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'd stand on this milk crate and I'd start shucking these oysters. But then the only place I could stand was next to the door and then it'd be winter. And so, the door would be open because they've got to get all the water out. And you're shucking oysters, and the oysters are cold. So for like three, four hours, my hands would just be, you know, I'd just be shucking these unbelievably cold oysters. <laughs> and on average, that project should take like an hour. Yeah. But I was just so slow at it. So yeah. I just kept co- trying to come in as early as possible. And it took a, it took me a long time to really get up to speed on everything, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, cutting fish, shucking the oysters. I'm the same way, man. It always took me just a little bit more effort to like get there. Yeah, you know? and then you look around and the guys that are just like doing it like it's so easy. You're like, God damn. Yeah, you totally. Know? Yeah, I, I felt that way my whole career, man. It's always like I'm behind and I need to come in earlier and push harder in order to be able to be as good as these guys around me. Mm -hmm. But that's how you know you're in a good spot because everybody's better than you. Yeah, 100%. You know, I'm going to make sure that I'm as good as these guys someday, you know. It's very cool. So you're cutting fish and, um, you know, you're with Dave and Brady for that year. Uh, What are you doing after that? Did you move up after that? Yeah, so I got an opportunity to go on the line. Okay. And What's the first station on the hotline you were on? So the first station I worked was Garbage Okay. And so, got on the line, worked garbage there. When I got on the line was when we were in the temp kitchen. Yeah. And so, as fish butcher, I actually got the core award for the restaurant, which was really cool. That's cool. And so, there's a time where, you know, we had just moved kitchens and some people were traveling and whatnot. So, we're short-staffed and I got an opportunity to kind of like uh, help the sous chefs lead the Comey team. And it was really cool, and I got recognized by Chef Keller and Chef David Breeden and Michael Manillo. And it was, you know, it it meant a lot to me that they would give me that reward, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, moved from there onto the line. Yeah. And then, again, you know, it's kind of like, you know, back to, you know, like, being at the balsams, cutting that onion, like, once I got in the line, at, at this point, I, I was very well-versed at, I had been fish butcher for over two years. And so I was very well-versed at, like, the French Laundry's way of doing things. Yeah. You know? But the kind of issue that I dealt with once I got onto the line, it wasn't that bad on the Garmage. But then I moved to Canapé, and then I moved to Fish. And I, wor- I worked the Fish Station for a long time. I was on the Fish Station for around another... I was at the French Laundry for a total of four years, and I worked at Fish Station for like a year and a half, and when I was on the hotline, kind of the biggest thing I worked with, worked on there, was just like being able to focus properly. Yeah. And so I was always kind of like that spaz cook, you know? Yeah. And so a very bad ADD. Hurricane. You know, you're kind of like going. 